Hello, welcome to the first of two workshops about creating anti-racist publishing practices and programs. This workshop is an orientation to anti-racist documents in digital publishing and is co-sponsored by the Council of Editors of Learned Journals, Library Publishing Coalition, and the Open Education Network. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm the Publishing Director with the Open Education Network based at the University of Minnesota in the United States. I'm joined by Barb Thies, the OEN Community Manager. I'm gonna start with a few housekeeping details. Live transcription should be enabled. If you don't see it, please let us know. We are committed to providing a safe and welcoming environment for all attendees. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. We will be recording this first session only, which will shortly be available on our YouTube channel soon. So during the hour we have together today, we will get oriented to several anti-racist documents in digital publishing so that we can consider how they might be adapted for OER, journal, and scholarly publishing organizations. Our goal is to offer a proactive foundation for authors, reviewers, and editors to develop strategic anti-racist and anti-oppressive initiatives within their own spheres of influence. Now I'd like to introduce our co-presenters and turn things over to them. We are joined today by Cheryl Ball, Director of the Digital Publishing Collaborative at Wayne State University, as well as Joshua Neds Fox, Coordinator for Digital Publishing at Wayne State University. And I'm going to hand things over to Joshua now. Thank you, Karen, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I, see, I see a number that represents you all, um, but I'm delighted that you're here. I'm going to start um, by acknowledging that Cheryl and I are coming to you from the Metro Detroit area uh, and Wayne State University, and uh, that Wayne State itself rests on Wawiatanong, the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Three Fires Confederacy, which is the Ojibwe Odawa, Potawatomi, and Wyandotte nations, and that Wayne State affirms indigenous sovereignty and honors all the tribes with a connection to Detroit. And I specifically note that we advance our educational objectives here in Detroit on a foundation of colonial violence and erasure, for which this acknowledgement does the absolute bare minimum of reparation. If you're ready to uh, begin doing your own learning, I urge you to engage with the students involved either in your university or in ours, uh, Native American student organizations. Our organization helped advocate for the original text of this land acknowledgement, which I have adapted today to remove the implicit assertion that the 1807 Treaty of Detroit justifies the engines of genocide. I'm also going to link to two organizations in the chat that you might consider supporting the International Indigenous Youth Council, which grew from the Standing Rock Indigenous Uprising of 2016 uh, to protest the Dakota Access Pipeline and is establishing Indigenous activism for future generations. And the NDN Collective, which is an Indigenous-led organization dedicated to building the collective power of Indigenous peoples and creating sustainable solutions on Indigenous terms. All of that being said, welcome. This is Anti-Racist Documents in Digital Publishing uh, for Journals and OER. And as Karen said, I'm Joshua, and my uh, co-presenter today is uh, Dr. Cheryl Ball. Uh, let's see how I advance this. Um, this session is going to outline the mission of open access publishing within libraries with focus on anti-racist and DEI efforts. And um, we're going to discuss how uh, anti-racist and equity statements and guidelines of the um, various organizations we're, we're talking about today offer a proactive foundation for authors, reviewers, and editors to develop strategic anti-racist and anti-oppressive initiatives in their own spheres of influence. We want to talk a little bit from our own context uh, about library publishing and open access value. So we're library publishers. We um, coordinate digital publishing in a university library. Uh, and we want to um, we want to think before we jump into documents, anti-racist documents, why uh, why 
what is the the moral case for OA as an as an equity issue? I'm going to pass it over to Cheryl Ball to start here. Thanks, Joshua. So we start. Uh, we know not everybody's coming from a library publishing perspective, and and Joshua and I both. Uh, as he said, work within library publishing uh, and also within independent publishing um, that's not affiliated with an organization or institution. Um, but we do look to the Library Publishing Coalition uh, for a lot of our um, values and guidelines in the work that we do. And since not everybody may be familiar with that organization or with how defining library publishing, we wanted to start with that basic definition, um, talking about a set of activities that support the creation, dissemination, and curation of scholarly, creative, and educational works. So the journal work that we do, that we all probably do, and the OER work that many of us do all fall, can fall within um, this definition. Further, uh, within that, we work with, um, um, within the Library Publishing Coalition's set of uh, five basic values that sort of um, underpin all of the work and the mission that we, that we um, strive to achieve. We start with professionalism. Um, and professionalism helps us, the organization as a whole helps to seek uh, to improve the quality and sustainability of library publishing through advocacy, professional development, and shared best practices. And openness, which we will talk a little bit more about today, um, we believe firmly that the products and the processes of scholarly communication should be as open uh, as possible, thereby increasing the reach and impact of scholarship worldwide. Third, uh, diversity as a value is incredibly important to us in that we, we recognize that li and we recognize that library publishing has a unique opportunity to amplify underrepresented voices in scholarly communication. And through the work that we do there, we strive to promote inclusivity in all of our professional activities. And this is both at an organizational level and in our uh, our our publishing unit at Wayne State specifically um, in, in alignment with these particular values. And uh, fourth, we uh, strive for collaboration and working towards um, leveraging our collective knowledge and resources to enhance our own publishing e efforts and to support each other through this work. And that's a big part of what we're talking about today. We're bringing you some resources uh, that we are familiar with, that we've come across in different avenues to be able to share and, and leverage that collective knowledge uh, for others' benefit. And then finally, in terms of innovation, we we uh, continue to evolve as much as we possibly can and uh, uh, to explore and engage with new technologies and new modes of publishing. And a lot of this is done within the context of, uh, in library publishing, it's almost exclusively done within a context of open access. So I'm going to turn it over to Joshua to give you a little bit more about that. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, some of this is, uh, I, I'm assuming that that many of you are already familiar um, with this dichotomy between the status quo in scholarly uh, and, and other publishing and the, um, the vision and concept of open access. But I want to talk about it explicitly for a minute because, as I said earlier, it's good to establish the moral case for open access as an equity issue. Uh, we we, we see the we see the vision of open access um, as uh, the, the idea that the, now that the means of production is distributed, uh, the means of delivering material is distributed. It's not one copy, one person, but that the internet allows us to make um, infinite copies of a thing for relatively uh, cheap. We have the possibility of, um, of, of sort of freeing material to go anywhere. And that's allowed us to dream about um, a, a larger context for openness. That is the, um, the well-known um, five R's uh, of open content that we would, we would further open material so that it's free of any, um, restrictions on use as long as well as free of restrictions on access 
that we would be able to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute the materials that we work with. That's the foundation of open educational materials. Um, we will acknowledge that open access is a continuum, um, sort of based on the, um, the uh, level of engagement of the creators of open materials from barely open to widely open uh, to fully open, that is the public domain, the materials that have absolutely no intellectual restrictions and are freely available online. And we acknowledge that it's free as in free puppy, um, that open access takes work and that that labor uh, is generally uh, undertaken um, in varying degrees of acknowledgement um, and, and that uh, for an item to remain open, um, you got to continually water and feed it and probably walk it and et cetera. It's over and against um, the idea of rights management or intellectual property um, with restriction that closed or toll access is kind of like a closed door. Uh, and you might um, think about the university library's big deal uh, in this um, category. For instance, five publishers in three countries represent 60% of scholarly publishing at the moment. Uh, and that 60% is um, intensely monetized and highly uh, restricted in, um, in the, the framework of um, intellectual property. And while much of that material is, um, it may sit somewhere on the spectrum of quote unquote open access, uh, it, um, it, it actually constitutes uh, a force for the status quo and against equity um, to continue to have materials uh, siloed in gatekeeping um, uh, commercial publishers uh, against um, access both to contribute to and to access that research. The moral argument, the medium, uh, of the, of the internet and of research demands access. And the moral argument is straightforward. It's a, a research is a public good and everyone should have access to it, particularly when it's paid for with public money. And this argument um, can be furthered uh, by pointing out that OA is a social justice issue and that approaches to open access can either lessen or exacerbate inequities. So current access is inequitable. Reggie Raju and others argue that open access needs to be situated in social justice in order not to simply replicate the status quo. So in an unequal publishing system, equality can consolidate uneven distribution of power, can, can continue marginalization or disenfranchisement. And before we reach equality, equity is necessary. Uh, to put it another way, you could say that some of our interventions into open access can exacerbate the scholarly communications divide for the global south or for marginalized communities in the global north. For instance, transformative agreements guarantee, um, what is guaranteed in a transformative agreement is profit for publishers. Uh, the, the pay to publish model shifts the accessibility issue from the end of the process to the start of the process. And now those without funder fees are disenfranchised. Uh, and it's important for us to understand um, that that, that uh, requires that we begin to think in different ways about the ways that we um, proceed uh, in uh, in, in creating equity and open access. Uh, Reggie Raju is, um, is fond of pointing out the um, example of unconscious and conscious bias in um, the gatekeeping function of science. That is, uh, he tells the story or he, he actually um, often invites this researcher to tell her own story. Uh, uh, African horticulturist who could not get published in the prestige journals published in, in the 60% uh, Global North um, science journals because they regarded the crops that she was describing uh, as weeds. And um, 
her research is now being adopted by local communities to provide food security uh, and suddenly is garnering attention because it, um, it, it she took other channels and has shown impact. So it's our bias that um, that prohibits uh, and extends inequity, pro prohibits equity and extends inequity. And open access is um, a model, hopefully, for um, implementing um, an indigenous-led, uh, socially just, and equitable um, knowledge uh, dissemination sphere. So I want to second, sorry, Joshua, let yeah, me yeah. interject for just a moment and say um, I, I second everything that Joshua says, but I'm also aware that you know there's probably people on this call who do not function from an open access model. And so what I want to clarify is that while that is definitely our bias <laughs> that we are coming with, um, the concept of, of open access as it's related to openness is sort of what we're striving for in communicating what these documents are about, right? They're about um, uh, opening your processes uh, to be more transparent, um, opening your peer review to be uh, to be aware of the biases that are present uh, within them that often reinforce a white supremacist or colonialist approach to uh, research. So if you are, happen to be a total access uh, editor or publisher and you're here, stay tuned because we're not, you know, the things that we're gonna talk about are, are not solely for open access um, uh, publications, even though Joshua and I kind of wish that they would all be open access. Uh, thank you for having a, a grounding um, moral voice uh, in, in opposition to my radicalism, Cheryl. I appreciate it. Uh, um, okay, so we're going to move on um, specifically to some of the documents that we're, uh, we hope to talk about today. Um, and before we do that, I should note that it is a um, the, the idea of um, binary answers, yes or no, and uh, of, you know, sort of once for all um, uh, um, solutions is a very uh, white and or white supremacist value. And so um, documents are created and they and they then sort of begin to recede in time uh, as to their usefulness and new documents need to overtake them. So some of these documents um, are are brand new or in the process of being renewed. Some have stood for some time. Some are works um, of constant progress. And that approach to anti-racist documents is actually um, a counteraction to a, a white uh, value. So that's something to keep in mind as you're um, engaging with these documents. Uh, anti-racist documents in library publishing. So. The first document we want to um, talk about is the ethical framework uh, for library publishing. Uh, this is a resource of the um, Library Publishing Coalition, and um, it was uh, conceived at the membership meeting in 2017. I don't know if you um, can think back before two years of pandemic. Uh, but there were an awful lot of um, inc incredible social upheavals happening in 2017 as well, 2016, 2017, um, that have had a, a impact. And I think the um, library publishing community was um, reeling under the consideration of those uh, social realities and, um, and felt that the time was right to, uh, to begin to interrogate our own values and inscribe them um, into a framework uh, for library publishing. Uh, it was um, so it's the the preamble to the framework highlights the importance of library values and our responsibility as library publishers to center our publishing practice around them. And uh, and so a working body sort of developed uh, ad hoc um, and um, was contributed to in a number of different forums um, by varying members of the community to come up with a, a document that would create a framework. It pulls together um, existing codes of ethics, think um, uh, 
COPE, uh, for instance, along with resources um, from a number of related fields and contextualizes them for library publishers. One of the top level headings in the framework, which uh, itself is, um, which itself is, hold on just a second, um, divided into a number of sections, uh, is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, uh, it, it, it sits um, in the same level with publishing practice, accessibility, privacy and analytics, and academic and intellectual freedom. But I'm focusing on this section, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, because I feel like it's a good introduction to the ways in which the ethical framework can help you think about your own construction of anti-racist um, documents, policies, and practices in whatever your sphere is. Uh, so. Um, the section had, um, is specifically helpful in uh, a coalition of resources um, relating to things like editorial and peer review, uh, contribution to research impact, um, organizational DNI and an organizational culture uh, that um, that that, are, that sort of can help. Um, you begin to do your own learning uh, regarding how to approach uh, DEI in your organization, and um, and and I think that those resources uh, are helpful, but they're followed then by sort of a vision for new resources that we might need, uh, and I, I find this. Um, useful because, for instance, um, one of the resources that it advocates for is a guide for peer reviewers on um, judging submissions from um, non-native English authors. And that document uh, is beginning to um, emerge. Uh, we, we the, the document suggests, the ethical framework suggests that um, sample educational materials on building diverse editorial boards are needed. Um, that case studies and reports from library publishers, which demonstrate a commitment to equity is needed. And so these sort of um, visions of the future of the, the kinds of resources that are needed to build up this area are really helpful for us to begin to think about what we might need um, in creating uh, anti racist um, practice and policy in our own organizations. And then the um, section ends with a number of recommendations uh that give us concrete steps that we can take um towards uh implementing dei in our contexts um leading off with creating a diversity statement for your publishing program uh and th that sort of list of um recommended actions is also a good place to sort of bookmark as you're beginning to think about how do i approach dei um, in my context the ethical framework uh, was released in 2018, so that's you know a good three years, three four years ago now, and it's currently um, in a working group to um, to iterate to a version two, uh, and we're pretty excited uh, to see what comes out of that working group um, in terms of an updated uh, framework for uh, ethics and library publishing. The second uh, document we want to talk about um, is uh, C4DISC's Toolkits for Equity. You may already be aware um, of uh, C4DISC's work. Uh, hopefully you are. Um, uh, excuse me. This is the Coalition for Diversity and Inclusion in Scholarly Communication. And um, it's a it's a, a member organization of uh, trade and professional publishing organizations uh, that has come together to initially to um, 
hold a set of values um, towards equity and uh, and to create a joint statement of principles that uh, partners and members can sign on to um, to begin to spark uh, action and commitment to uh, diversity and inclusion in scholarly communication. It's a number of members. I'm certain you're familiar with um, bodies like NASIG and OASPA, the Society for Scholarly Publishing, um, the Association of University Presses. These are all members. The Library Publishing Coalition is a member of C4DISC, as is Crossref. Um, and uh, and so one of their early and, in, and incredibly impactful uh, projects are these toolkits for equity. They follow from C4DISC's joint statement uh, of principles, excuse me, which is a fairly um, comprehensive uh, set of commitments um, with references and um, and they attempt to operationalize those in really um, incredible detail uh, in various contexts. There are currently two published toolkits, an anti-racism toolkit for allies and for organizations um, that they're working on a couple more, uh, one for disability equity and a toolkit specifically for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, see, I'm trying to, there we go. Uh, the toolkit for allies is specifically for white people, they say, because white supremacy uh, grants unearned advantages to whites. And because recognizing these advantages and actively resisting racism is the most crucial work that white people can embrace in order to create meaningful change. Um, and then the toolkit for organizations backs up a little bit and goes broader um, to help any individual in an organization implement inclusive policies, procedures, and norms. Excuse me. Uh, I want to focus on that toolkit for organizations as we talk about this. Uh, it's, it's really useful um, because it's, it helps us create strategy around culture transformation, metrical analysis, um, and supporting staff. And uh, the, the toolkit itself it includes an extensive resource list. So it provides a bibliography for self-study um, that can be really helpful uh, to organizations sort of hoping to um, enter into this work. It's completely uh, CC licensed under a non-commercial share alike license. Uh, and so you, you can, you know, it's, it's, it embraces many of the five R's. Uh, and it builds from the foundational concepts in the toolkit um, for allies. Uh, it's, it's also incredibly comprehensive. And so you, you could do uh, well to work your way through the toolkit for organizations as you're considering anti-racist um, policy or practice in your own efforts, uh, because it's likely that you're building on thought um, that's gone before you from um, people who are dedicated to transforming the scholarly communication sphere. Uh, I, I wanna say here sort of at the end of these two documents that I am um, involved in the development and the continuance of the ethical framework for library publishing, but that I have no connection to the um, anti-racist toolkits that C4DISC is creating. C4DISC has um, an extensive uh, credits list for the people who have worked on these documents, um, and you should avail yourself to that as you're considering it. I'm going to pass it over to Cheryl to talk about a couple more uh, 
of these resources that are particularly useful. Great, thank you, Joshua. So uh, the next one that we want to bring to your attention is the Library Public Pub, the Library Publishing Coalition's Roadmap to Anti-Racist Practice. And this is Joshua and I served on the task force, uh, the diversity and, uh, diversity and inclusion task force of the LPC, uh, which was the originating task force that create that created this roadmap. Um, but there's a new committee that has superseded um, that task force that is working on updating this roadmap. And I know at least one of those committee members, um, Angel Peterson, is in this call, and perhaps others are as well. Um, so this is a, we are presenting you um, a, a, a vestige of the current document with the understanding that uh, this document is in the process right now of being um, updated dated in a very similar manner to the one that this one was created, which was through a community call with the library publishing members in 2019. Um, they, the, uh, the task force, um, the task force pitched um, several questions to the community and they collected all the responses to this through the community call and through the um, through uh, consolidation of those answers was, were able to come up with this roadmap. Um, and one of the quotes that I like from this, the anti-racist roadmap introduction is, above all, the Library Publishing Coalition needs to envision the landscape of scholarly publishing that we want to exist and devise the mechanisms we need to take us there. And this roadmap is one of the ways to do that. Um, so these are some of the questions that um, that sorry these are the questions that were used in that community call uh, which are really um, getting at the heart of matters and asking the community to respond not only uh, with with helping them think through how um, how individual members can uh, think about their anti-racist practice um, but how the organization can um, so one of the ways that we've been thinking about this document internally uh, within the Wayne State Library publishing system, for instance, is how we can um, how we can use this roadmap as a way to to think about mapping out our own practices, right? And Kairos, the journal that I edit, also uses this document in a similar way, um, thinking about how do we need to create as an organization. Uh, an anti-racist publishing venue, um, and how do we involve the community in doing in doing that? And and I love the fourth question. It's very important, right? What does accountability look like? Going back to Joshua's statement earlier that these these documents shouldn't just be written and then filed away with a check mark next to oh we have our anti-racist statement, right? Like that doesn't do anybody any good if we're not continually reviewing. Um, uh, assessing and revising as needed and putting our, our goals into actual action items. Um, so the roadmap was developed through using these four questions. And then um, uh, I wanna skip the next slide, Joshua, because I already talked about that and go to the structure. Thank you. Um, the, the roadmap is very cool, I think, because it lays out publicly in like six month, two year, and sort of continuing big ideas um, it, within each of these six sections or themes. What, who is responsible, like what the action is that needs to be taken uh, and who is responsible for that action within the LPC community, whether it's the, the LPC board, whether it's the membership, whether it's a particular committee within the LPC organization, et cetera. So, um, Again, I mentioned that this document was structured with sort of time-based um, goals in mind. And now that it's been um, almost a year since the first iteration of this came out, right? Those first six months were completed by the time the task force finished its duties last July, which was fantastic. And so now the new committee is revising um, what the next six months or what the next roadmap will look like. Um, and they're having a community call. Maybe Angel can pop in the chat and, and let us know when that community call might be happening. If, if it's been scheduled, I can't remember right now. Um, 
So then from there we go on to the anti-racist scholarly reviewing practices document. And this is a document that was created by a set of independent scholars in uh, technical and professional communication. Um, in, in light of in in light of all of the trauma happening in the black and indigenous and people of and the communities of color last year uh, these scholars got together uh, thank you angel um, and decided to write their own set of guidelines <laughs> independently and people in writing studies tend to do things on their own as sort of a diy effort anyways um, there's not a lot of guiding organizations for this kind of work within it like the library publishing coalition or c4 disc or other uh, organizations might offer uh, so they just ad hoc it and came up with this um, review heuristic which includes um, uh, let's see in the organization if you go to the next slide thank you uh, what the document is how to use it um, and specifically focusing on academic review processes uh, and how they reinscribe racism uh, the scenarios and stories in this document are, if, if you haven't already been following along things like the guest posts in the scholarly uh, kitchen um, on, on uh, racist practices and university presses and things like that, um, the scenarios here will be very enlightening to you uh, as uh, if you identify as a white person. Um, the scenarios will be probably unfortunately very familiar to you if you identify as something other than white um, and those are meant to be uh, illustrative right to to say here's here's what actually goes on and even if you think this isn't happening at your own publication it probably is because we can't all micromanage every single editor reviewer etc and so then the bulk of this document is spent with this heuristic guide which is just simply a set of questions that go through um, how to recraft your uh, your scholarly uh, reviewing practices uh, for different audiences. Next slide, please, Joshua. Um, and here's some of the um, the guidance that it offers. Right, recognizing that there's a range of expertise and encourage citation practices that represent that expertise uh, and the different epistemological foundations on which research can be built. Uh, that doesn't always come from within the within the um, discourse communities of academia. Um, also, to recognize and intervene and to prevent harmful scholarly work uh, in the publication process uh, and in published scholarship. And there's been plenty of examples, unfortunately, in the last couple of years of scholarship that has gotten to print that has been incredibly harmful uh, to certain communities um, simply because a traditional double anonymous peer review process may or may not have been used. Um, and so things get through the system. So how can we reevaluate our own guidelines to, um, to, to prevent that? Um, you can read the rest of these here. Um, and that is an extensive part of the document and I encourage everyone to go uh, check, that, check that out. Um, you can sign on to, to this document if you support it and uh, many individuals as well as um, institutions or organizations or publishers, uh, a couple of publishers have signed on um, to say that they, they co-sign everything that's happening in the statement um, in, this, in this set of guidelines. We've used it at, uh, it's been used at several journals in writing studies and I don't know about beyond that, but I'd be curious to, to find out to evaluate our own peer review heuristics uh, to figure out how we can better um, better create peer review guidelines that are uh, fundamentally anti-racist. Um, and that's been to good effect in the last year, which has been nice. Um, I will also note that this, this is the document on which the second of these co-sponsored workshops um, will be focusing, and that one's in February. Uh, uh, Fortunately slash unfortunately, that workshop has already reached capacity um, of 50 people because we're going to be doing some hands on looking at your peer review guidelines to to reassess and revise them. And we only had space for a certain number of people uh, to do that with uh, just to keep it manageable. But that doesn't mean that you can't do it 
in your own venues. And I'm happy to talk to people through that process if they want um, outside of the scope of that workshop. So uh, that brings us to our last section, which is about using these resources. And we've talked a little bit about how we're doing that um, you know, individually in our own venues or our own units. Um, and Joshua, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to, to go through these with everybody. Sure. Uh, it's, um, it might be important to point out a couple things, this sort of as a side note before we um, talk the broader picture about using these resources. One is that um, anti-racist actions in a sphere tend to overlap. And so for instance, the um, heuristics uh, in um, anti-racist reviewing that Cheryl just um, described is uh, serves as a response, maybe not um, intentionally, but it does to the um, needed resource list that was in the ethical framework. Um, it was it was pointed out at that time that we needed some um, uh, anti-racist peer review uh, guidance, and that um, document is being created. The other thing to point out about all of these, um, in, including arguably the uh, toolkit, but especially the um, ethical framework, the anti-racist roadmap, and the um, reviewing heuristics, are tools that we didn't have that we needed for our context. And they, so they are um, folks getting together and creating what they need uh, in order to proceed in an anti-racist fashion. And that that's an important um, principle for the kind of work that you're hoping to do with these documents. That is, that you have a context and that you need to move forward in it. And other people's documents will help prompt you, but they won't get you all the way there. Ultimately, you're gonna see a gap that you need to fill um, and that your forward action in your context is going to create some new, um, uh, you know, paradigm um, that can work against the status quo of white supremacy and racism. That's important to note about these documents. So how can you use these um, resources, these and the other resources you will no doubt um, stumble across as you begin to um, survey this landscape? Uh, well, most importantly, um, as the preamble to the anti-racist toolkit for allies said, you need to affect your own education, that, um, that, that you uh, have work to do for yourself and that this toolkit it, is um, a way of helping you get there. Uh, you, you need to, you perhaps need to develop your own research agenda. Um, and these prompts can um, help with that. Hold on for just a moment. I'm going to let my family know that I'm in the middle of a presentation <laughs> so they can act accordingly. All right, that's been sorted. Uh, um, develop your own research agenda. So what don't you know that you need to know um, and how, um, how can these documents um, prompt you in that way? They're almost certainly these um, the, the, these various documents are going to prompt you to interrogate and change your own personal practice. That is that um, all of us are steeped in a culture of white supremacy. And so um, it's inevitable that we are operating in ways that uphold the status quo and we will find aspects of our own practice that um, we want to challenge and change. Um, these documents are helpful uh, to that kind of work. Uh, the documents help you create spaces for anti-racist engagement. That is, you're in a particular context in a particular community, um, and and the actions, policies, um, paradigms that you engage with in these documents are going to create spaces for engagement. Uh, I think specifically of the, um, I think specifically of the uh, peer review document. That that is a that that suddenly opens up an entire space for anti-racist engagement in the um, conduct of peer review, and so that's a a place where you can do actual work that pushes against the status quo. 
uh, the documents are especially helpful to advocate, help you advocate for organizational change. That is, um, uh, they can um, give you a framework for beginning to uh, analyze and then change the systems uh, that you your assessment and reporting. Um, somebody is going to ask you to do that uh, in your um, context. And, uh, and there are um, elements of these. Hold on just a second. Sorry, microwave averted. Uh, uh, and so th these can these can help you know uh, what can what can constitute um, uh, assessment for success for failure, uh, and, and how do I report those things? Um, engaging with these documents is is going to give you tools for holding yourself and others accountable. Um, that is, once you know, you can begin develop the, to develop the structures uh, that um, that uh, that that give you um, ways of being accountable to each other. And I think this is really important. That is, that um, we we don't move forward without mutual accountability. That is, that in a space, let's say, like scholarly communications or library publishing. Unless we have a set of colleagues with with which we are moving forward and for whom which we are um, we're, we're lifting up accountability, um, we can very easily uh, just begin to um, reinscribe practices of disequity. Uh, use these documents to help you hold yourself and others accountable. Um, and, and finally, and my final suggestion is that the documents give you prompts to rehabilitate your infrastructure. That is, are you counting on tools and or systems that um, re reify the status quo? Uh, and are there ways that you can begin to adopt new tools, new systems, new um, technologies of practice that, uh, that can move you um, in an anti-racist direction. So as you, as you engage with these and other documents, I encourage you to keep these, um, these prompts in mind to think about ways in which they might affect your, um, your own practice. Look at that. It's the final slide. And we do have <laughs> some time for questions. Uh, this is our um, program email address, and that will get first to Cheryl and then to me. Uh, <laughs> and um, these citations uh, refer to the big orange quotations in the um, OA as a moral issue section that we reported on earlier. So we're happy to hear about any questions or comments that you might have, um, as well as, uh, you know, I noted in the chat that if, if you know of or have created any, any other documents or resources um, that you're using for anti-racist practices in your own publishing units, we'd be very happy to know about those either here or through email. We're seeing some thank you so muches, and a couple of um, these are going to be useful resources. And that is an excellent outcome uh, for a presentation like this. Yes. We've been having um, one of the ways that we have used these documents uh, ha has been in our in our internship onboarding. 
with our publishing unit, um, which actually we have our very first meeting with them in 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm excited about that. <laughs> so we end up talking um, quite a bit about uh, library publishing as a discipline, since that's the context that the interns are working within. Um, and then how, these, how the values of library publishing intersect with anti-racist practices. And then we can draw on these documents to talk about, um, about not only how the two of us approach our editorial and publishing work through the unit and through uh, the, the, the organizations that we're affiliated with, um, but how the students might think about um, using these kinds of frameworks for, for, uh, for engaging with other organizations or work events, you know, work situations that they might come across in their own futures. And we've gotten feedback from them that they're um, surprised and delighted and find it helpful as well. So we're glad to be able to pass that information on uh, to those uh, who are still learning. So we have a question from Abby. Do you have any, besides the citations here, authors or teams whose work you find to be particularly impactful for discussing equity in publishing, not just frameworks, but discussions and research? Yes, yeah, Joshua's smiling. <laughs> Abby, I do want to um, commend you to uh, Martin Eve's recent um, uh, uh, compilation, Reassembling Scholarly Communications. It's sitting at the bottom of this slide. Um, it is a it is a very broad reaching um, uh, um, consideration uh, of scholarly communications as it stands now um, from a anti-racist perspective and, um, and and it's an excellent place to start it also is a, a a sort of bibliography of bibliographies for the moment uh in, in terms of the kinds of research into um anti-racist practice in scholarly communications and the, the research and implications i think you could do worse than starting here it's from mit press uh, and there is an open version um, available uh, at that publisher. Um, I, I guess that would be my that would be my go to at the moment. It incorporates many of the voices that you would find um, atomized elsewhere uh, in in one volume, and so that's that can be really helpful. Joshua, what would you say? Because uh, when I first saw this book come out, um, I was like, oh, this book looks very white and male to me. Um, so how would you respond to that? Well, you know, uh, Martin is white and male, uh, and so is, um, gray, but, uh, but the content of the book is anything but, um, and so research from across the globe, from across a range of identities, um, and focusing on, um, a range of understandings, uh, that push against the, um, the, the uh, s status quo narrative of white supremacy. Um, that that would be my so, sort of don't judge the book by its cover. It would be my, um, right. my take on that. Thank you. Um, in addition, I would uh, I would recommend um, work by uh, um, Kina Ulachuk. Um, hopefully, I pronounced that correctly. Um, Kina Uluak Ulachuk. Um, uh, she's an Inuit scholar uh, in technical and professional communication, and she's written quite a bit on multi-marginalized authors and citation practices. Um, I'll pull up her website here momentarily, and she has co-authored a bunch of stuff with um, Rebecca Walton, who's a professor at Utah State University. Uh, Kena is at Virginia Tech now. Um, and they are editor and managing editor. Rebecca's the editor of Technical Communication Quarterly, um, and Kena was managing editor for a while. And so they've done quite a bit of, of research, and Kena has published, and her dissertation work was also on this. Uh, that hopefully she's turned into a book on um, on the intersection of um, representation, community knowledge, indigenous knowledge, uh, citation practices, publishing, uh, that kind of that kind of work. Um, and that's in addition to uh, you know the the many articles that uh, Harrison Inofuko and Charlotte Rowe have published um, that we've and and Emily Drabinsky we've got them quoted here that you see. 
Thank you for the questions and the conversation in chat. And thank you both for your recommendations and guidance through these documents. Since we are nearing the end of our time together, I will go ahead and invite you to join us in thanking our co-presenters, Cheryl Ball and Joshua Neds Fox, as well as the Council of Editors of Learned Journals and the Library Publishing Coalition for co-sponsoring this workshop with the Open Education Network. We look forward to seeing many of you soon. And until then, we send our best wishes. Thanks, Bye, everybody. everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you all.